in the last 10 years there has been no other industry that has grown in leaps and bounds for commerce and accounting graduates as much as the fund accounting industry. The fund accounting industry has grown so dramatically in the last few years thanks to so many reasons a because india is a hub of high quality talent we are a hard working set of people and we also are very very rich in a global pool of accounting and commerce talent therefore a lot of hedge funds have outsourced this activity of fund accounting to many of the captives over here not so much captives as much as third party providers and these third party providers have been instrumental in hiring uh, accounting graduates finance graduates economics majors across different fields across different functions in this aspect hi everybody i'm your learning partner sushila hariharan and in this video we're going to take a detailed look and understand what is the meaning of fund accounting and hence this little <laughs> uh, kind of a twist like a 360 degree view of what is fund accounting. While I've been harping about the fact that this is largely for commerce and accounting graduates, I find that a lot of engineers too are working in hedge fund accounting, if not necessarily in the back end jobs, but they are very instrumental in creating a system interface and integration of different aspects of fund accounting software. So let's take a look at uh, what is fund accounting. But before that, we have to understand the growth of the hedge fund industry. And let's take a look at understanding what is a hedge fund. Okay. You know, before we jump into accounting, I always insist that before you jump into accounting, you've got to understand those businesses that the client is in. And if you don't understand that business, there is no way you can become a good accountant. You know, like it's just like an auditor or an, a compliance person who has to have a complete and thorough understanding of the business. So let's explain. I've already uploaded umpteen videos on hedge funds, but I'm still going to keep telling people that you've got to understand hedge funds because if you don't understand, hmm, the interviewer wants you to know not only about accounting principle, they also want you to know about how much of this industry you understand, this investment fund industry, okay? These are called as the pool funds or the investment funds industry. Let's take a look at some of them. A hedge fund, as the name hedge suggests, it's uh, sub initially started off as a risk reduction kind of a fund, but in the last few years, it has got uh, the exact opposite of it. Uh, it no longer does all trades only to hedge their underlying positions, but they also do a lot of trading to undertake new uh, trading positions in higher riskier asset classes. A hedge fund is a type of an investment fund. Now, what is the meaning of an investment fund? An investment fund is where the hedge fund pools in the capital, okay? Now, this concept of pooling in the capital is very simple. Let's say Sushila Hariharan, yours truly, starts a hedge fund and I collect money from Shah Rukh Khan and Virat Kohli and Amitabh Bachchan and anybody else who's a celebrity. The money of each of them is pooled together. So, it becomes a cumulative sum of money. Quite like the, uh, if you look at the Indian Ocean, okay? The Indian Ocean gets water from Bay of Bengal, it gets water from Arabian Sea. So, it becomes like a water so and all the water comes from different sources and then finally it traces back itself to himalaya which is across different continents across different countries so hedge funds also pool in the capital from different investors so the hedge fund that pools in the capital from different investors must therefore uh, identify who are these investors okay you know that in the last few years, there have been tremendous efforts made by many of the regulators to control what is called as money laundering, okay? And therefore, hedge funds are also supposed to identify these investors. These investors are called as accredited investors. Now, we do not have this concept of accredited investors or accredited investors in the case of mutual funds. In the case of mutual funds, as long as you're a retail investor and you have enough of money to invest, you can, you're qualified to invest, okay? But in the case of hedge fund, because the risk 
is high. It is important that a person or a fund who invests in the hedge fund understand that risk. Okay, understands global markets, understands the way uh, asset prices move, and only they're able to identify and you know have that sophistication. They should be allowed to invest in a hedge fund. It's really sometimes very very savvy because uh, what do I mean by savvy? Okay, it's like this. There's a big difference between gully cricket and World Cup cricket. Okay, World Cup cricket is little bit like cricket, a little bit more strategy, a little bit of teaming together, a little bit of taking advantage of everybody's you know strengths and trying to overcome their weaknesses, etc. Similarly, hedge funds also, uh, you know, they kind of invest in different assets, in different currencies, in different markets. Like, for example, a small retail investor in India, uh, sitting in Pune, might not want to invest in so accredited investors have to be people who have a solid understanding and appreciation of the risk that the hedge fund is taking. Because as you know, we always often hear in Indian markets, investments are subject to market risk. Please read the offer document carefully before investing. Well, it's exactly the same case in the case of hedge funds as well. Moving on. Hedge funds, as we know, deal with pooled funds. Pooled funds represent independent contributions from each of those accredited investors. The pool funds that is collected from the different accredited investors is invested in different asset classes. Okay, so as we understand, we can no longer attribute the individual money to the independent contribution. Therefore, we call it as a pooling, quite like the example that I already given about the Indian Ocean, which is a pool of uh, money, a uh, uh, pool of water from different kind, different sources. HF then uses this pooled funds, okay, and makes investments across different assets like equities, bonds, money markets, and commodities. Let's try and understand a little bit more about what we mean by formation of a hedge fund. How does an accredited investor know whether they should invest in that specific hedge fund or not? So let's understand the genesis of how a hedge fund is formed. A hedge fund is driven largely by <clears throat> the fact that it, it needs so much of capital. So question time, can a hedge fund raise capital from general public? The answer is an emphatic no. I've already explained the reasons as to why the hedge fund can't raise capital from the general public. It must necessarily raise capital only from investors who understand the risks involved in investing by the hedge fund. Okay, now let's understand what do the accredited investors do. The hedge funds raise capital from the accredited investors. That's already been explained. The accredited investors are identified differently by different hedge funds. Okay. For example, some hedge funds have a requirement that they must have a minimum net worth of $1 million. Some other hedge funds must say that they have must have an investable surplus of $2 million. So the definition of an accredited investor varies from hedge fund to hedge fund. Broad guidelines are provided by SEC, that's the Securities Exchange Commission, regarding the nature of the accredited investors. But suffice to say that if that six-figure number isn't there, then definitely they're not going to look at any other investor. So the investor walks into the table, shows that six figures that he is going to invest in, and that's how he becomes an accredited investor. The hedge fund which looks to raise capital must aggressively market the fund okay with the accredited investors this aggressive marketing this uh, understanding of what is the kind of products that are going to be offered etc is then sold to people like institutional investors pension funds and high net worth individuals institutional investors are those investors that use the capital to invest in different assets so they don't use their own money, okay? So institutional investors are an example of investors who invest capital on somebody else's behalf. This includes pension funds, mutual funds, hedge funds, as well as insurance companies. 
high net worth individuals also people who are superstars in their fields like sports celebrities or <clears throat> movie stars or nowadays even youtubers <laughs> are classified as accredited investors okay so accredited investors bring in a lot of capital to the table moving on what is the fund's objective what does the fund want to do with that pool of capital i always say intent and objective is the most important aspect of understanding the fund's performance you have to identify and articulate the fund's investing strategy the fund's investing strategy must clearly be defined so that investors who have that investment objective if there's a matching of minds if there's a matching of investing philosophies then they would definitely want to invest in that kind of a fund so therefore the fund's objective is could be it could be a macro fund it could be a growth fund it could be a long shot uh, fund it could be a distressed fund it could be an events driven fund you know it could be anything but as an investor do you want to invest in that kind of a fund for example if i am a investor restricted to only buying equities then i might not want to go on a long shot i might just want to buy a growth fund right so the fund's objective is clearly mentioned in the document so what is the document that you're talking about the document is called as ppm or the private placement memorandum the ppm or the private placement memorandum is a very elaborate invitation by the fund to accredited investors it's like a sales document it's like a marketing document which talks extensively about how the hedge fund is structured what is the past history of the hedge fund and the fund management team because remember in a in a hedge fund it's all about the fund management team how are they going to generate returns i mean companies like uh, uh, i mean hedge funds like blackrock etc have become so big because of the fact that they have consistently delivered on greater returns the ppm articulates the hedge fund strategy is it going to be a macro fund is it going to be a long shot fund it's going to be a, a growth fund is it going to be an event driven fund is it a distress debt fund etc so the private placement memorandum must articulate this hedge fund strategy if it doesn't do that it's going to be very difficult for the hedge fund to be able to collect capital because the investors have to identify why they are going to invest in the hedge fund and whether it matches with what is the investing philosophy of the hedge fund itself the private placement memorandum also explains generically the fee structure expense ratio and so on and so forth which the investor must know beforehand before they decide whether they want to participate in the hedge fund or not so remember all this is very very amoebic right now because the hedge fund manager is still collecting the capital he has to do a parallel uh, selling of the fund then only he'll get more capital he has to also identify the objectives he has to set up the research team so if it's going to be a new hedge fund that's launching for the very first time then all these activities actually go on parallelly the next question that is often asked is does the ppm uh, is it a summary of the offering or is it like a agreement no it's not an agreement the private placement memorandum is not an agreement it is only a marketing document okay it's like you read about hdfc home loan and then you actually understand the product that's what a ppm is like you sign the home loan agreement with hdfc only after you have taken the loan that's a limited partnership agreement okay big big differences between the two of them the ppm also explains what are the risk factors this has to be clearly articulated in the current scenario as well given the geopolitical uh, nebulence that is there in the whole world whether it's europe whether it's west asia whether it's latin america there are a lot of risk factors that are there in investing in different markets in different asset classes in different currencies yeah and that has to be clearly articulated now an assessment of risk is clearly the fund's assessment of risk if you are mapping with the same level of risk appetite then go ahead and invest in the fund otherwise don't bother to invest in the fund the private placement memorandum also gives a detailed description of the various securities that they're going to be investing in for example is it a distressed debt fund 
then it has to clearly say what is the kind of distressed debt that they're going to be investing. Distressed debt is debt that is already classified as C and below. Yeah. So the investor know that we're going to talk to companies that, uh, that are already on the verge of bankruptcy. Yeah. And therefore, you must be in a position to have that risk appetite to see whether you're willing to take on that risk in your portfolio. The private placement memorandum must mention the fee structure. Normally, most hedge funds have a dual structure of fees with different iterations in between them. The first, which is a mandatory fee, is the management fees. And the second is the incentive fees or the performance fees. The fee structure has to be clearly mentioned in the PPM or the private placement memorandum. The management fees is charged as a percentage of assets under management, AUM. This AUM is different for different investors, right? So every accredited investor pays different management fee. Is this clear? It's a flat rate, but the, but the dollar terms that is paid by every investor changes according to the uh, fund that they're talking about. <clears throat> Typically, the management fees is between 1.5% to 2% of AUM, which is very, very high, given that, you know, all the 2022, 2023 hedge funds have barely been able to outperform, then uh, investors are getting a little savvy and asking for lower management fees. Management fees are used by the hedge fund to run the operations of the fund, and they're charged annually, mandatory, and they could be collected quarterly or semi-annually, etc., Management fees is, uh, is a no-brainer as far as calculations are concerned. What is a brainer is the performance fees or the incentive fees. Because, look, you're investing in a hedge fund because you want outperformance. And therefore, it is charged as a percentage of outperformance or overperformance. The private placement memorandum will mention the benchmarks against which the hedge fund will be compared, okay? The private placement memorandum must clearly tell you that the performance fees would be a certain percentage of the profits, okay? Most performance fees are subject to hurdle rates as well as high watermarks. These videos have already been uploaded and you can have a look at them. Performance fees therefore cannot be an annual charge. Obviously, it will be a charge that is collected at some point of time. And in fact, hedge funds have become so stringent in terms of collection of fees and limited partners also demand clawbacks in case there has been underperformance. So not only that, not only in a term of like five to seven years that the hedge fund is in existence, does the limited partner have to pay the outperformance fees in a year of underperformance? They are actually recovered back the performance fees as well. <clears throat> are hedge funds regulated? I love to ask this question to many of the interviewer to the interview candidates who appear for MBA college interviews or for uh, banking interviews, and I ask this question, and the first answer is no. Well, my friends, that answer is wrong. Hedge funds are regulated by SEC, okay? They, <clears throat> they just don't have the level of disclosures that mutual funds have. They are not stringently regulated. Does the hedge fund need to have SEC approval before commencing operations? Yes. Does the hedge fund have to disclose every month the, the statement of holding of its different funds? No. There is no public disclosure needed. It just needs to inform its existing investors on quarterly intervals or semi-annual intervals as decided between the general partner and the limited partner in the uh, limited partnership agreement. So hedge funds are regulated, but they are not subject to the stringent disclosures that are there otherwise for listed companies or for mutual funds. Moving on, <clears throat> the hedge fund structure has now to be decided whether it is going to be an onshore fund or an offshore fund, depending upon the tax status of the investor funds are structured. Onshore means the domicile is the same. Offshore means the two domiciles that are covered. 
I've already uploaded a video on both the domicile structures and you can have a look at that video as well. What is a LPA? A LPA is also called as a limited partnership agreement. What binds the accredited investors to the fund legally, not spiritually or emotionally, but legally is a limited partnership agreement. The LPA is a legal document. It is accepted in the court of law for contesting any kind of claims, including performance fees paid, clawbacks, etc. So the limited partnership agreement signed between the hedge fund and the different investors clearly articulates what are the procedures for admitting new partners, what are the rules and entitlements of the limited partners, what are the capital commitment of each of the partners to the fund and so on and so forth. So every partnership is mutually beneficial to both the limited partners as well as to the, <coughs> excuse me, general partner and the LPA articulates these rules. Okay. Suppose a partner wants to exit the fund. Can he, ex can the partner exit the fund only on uh, fund liquidation? No. Can the partner exit the fund before fund liquidation? Yes. If yes, then what is the lock-in period? All this has to be clearly mentioned and articulated in the limited partnership agreement. The limited partnership agreement, therefore, is a very critical document that is signed between the partners and the general partner and it is legal in nature. It has a standing in the court of law and this again explains why you cannot say that hedge funds are unregulated okay this is not like when you go for horse uh, you know horse race betting or something like that where you're just standing there and watching the horses run no 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 it's not like that it's extremely regular it is extremely uh, tight knit okay in terms of understanding the clauses understanding the agreements and typically in a hedge fund you would have hedge fund administrators who would be in a very clear position to explain what are the different clauses of the limited partnership agreement <clears throat> moving on <clears throat> some private equity firms have what is called as capital commitments which are mentioned in the limited partnership agreement this is not there in hedge funds it's mostly there in private equity the capital commitments uh, are uh, how much is a partner going to commit to the capital of the fund it will also help the fund know that a particular investor is going to contribute let's say five million dollars or eight million dollars to the fund vis-a-vis -vis the capital call which happens against the commitment this definitely helps the hedge fund you know manager achieve better planning a greater resource allocation as well as smarter portfolio management if they know how much capital is going to come in from different investors hedge fund organization structure in the last 15 years has moved uh, towards a trifurcation of front office, middle office and back office. This uh, trifurcation of functions is extremely fascinating because it happened with uh, the Bernie Madoff scam that took place a few years ago, actually many, many years ago. And, uh, who you know, ultimately the hedge fund closed down because it was branded as a Ponzi scheme. So a very well reputed hedge fund collapsed because of it being termed as a Ponzi scheme. And ever since then, hedge funds have decided to outsource some of their accounting and settlement functions to uh, different entities across the world. So let's take a look at what the front office does. The front office is an asset management company. The front office appoints the fund manager to do the trading. It puts together the fund by raising capital from different accredited investors. The front office is largely now like a holding company. Okay, uh, let me not use the word holding company. That would be wrong because uh, holding company has got tax implications. So let's just say that the front office is a asset management company that collects the capital from different investors. They appoint a fund manager who does the trading and asset allocation. That brings us to front office activities which involve 
liaising with different investors, profit driven as well as puts together teams in equity research, fixed income research, macro research before they decide what are the kind of markets they're going to be investing in. So the front office literally comprises every possible structure with refer reference to capital inflows, capital outflows, asset allocations, redemptions and so on and so forth. Then what does the middle office do? The middle office is my favorite department because it always is concerned about <coughs> risk management and compliance. Compliance in my mind is, the definition of compliance is, every organization sets off its own rules. Are your employees following those rules? That's the definition of compliance, okay? So middle office is the organization for ensuring that all employees are compliant with the organization's rules and regulations. This involves internal regulations as well as reporting standards set by the global regulators as well as the capital market regulators in the country that they're operating in. Hedge fund administration is now the head, is now the, is now the back office, okay? So what do we mean by a hedge fund administrator? So we had front office, we had middle office, we now have the back office. Back office is the entity that does accounting and settlements. Thanks to multiple scams like the Bernie Madoff scam in, uh, in the 2008, as well as uh, the Bering scam that took place about 15 years earlier, 1993, the activities of settlements and trading are bifurcated. Okay, the hedge fund administrator is a third party entity that does accounting and administration activity. Okay, this is a very important job because you have to know that there has to be a segregation of trading and settlements as well as accounting for transactions. Accounting for transactions is gets that much more authenticated and believable if it is done by third party regulators. In India, we have many, many uh, third party hedge fund administrators. We also have captives of banks like Global, uh, like Goldman Sachs, as well as Morgan Stanley, who do the hedge fund administration here. But we also have separate entities which do like FX fund services, which do these kind of activities. They account for transactions and settlement and trading is thus segregated between the two of them. Who are hedge fund administrators? These are third party entities that are responsible for providing accounting uh, services to the hedge fund. So can a third party entity provide to multiple hedge funds? Of course they can. Is there a large number of uh, accounting and commerce graduates who are recruited and appointed by these hedge fund administrators? Yes, they are. Typically, they work in the time zones that are different from the Asia time zones, depending on where the hedge fund is located. If they are doing it for European markets, then it's European, so European time zones, etc. The accounting graduate should have a very sound understanding of valuation and accounting. So within the hedge fund administration itself, you can have multiple roles in middle office or in settlements, in derivative settlements, in client servicing, asset servicing, and so on and so forth. If you like the content in this video, do subscribe to my YouTube channel. This video has been longer than usual because I always felt that we should have something which explains to the newcomers about what is the role of a hedge fund administrator as well as the role of hedge funds in different markets. I'm your new partner, Sushila Hariharan, signing off from this video. Thank you so much.